follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. That song brings back memories to me when I was working at Linda Vista. Our principal, Mr. McLean, sang that at chapel every single week. So I love that song and I can't help but think of him when I hear it. Our next song is number 483, I Need Thee Every Hour. Number 672.
Dear Heavenly Father, it is with awe that we come into your sanctuary. We thank you for this church. We thank you for this Adventist presence here in this community. And we pray now that you will fill this sanctuary with your Holy Spirit to lift us up to heavenly things. Bless us with precious, nourishing, nutritious, spiritual food from heaven this day so that we may be blessed and we can be a blessing to you and your kingdom and a blessing to others. We're asking this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God has given you talents and opportunities that are unequally yours. Are you willing to use your gifts in the way that God intends? And are you willing to summon the discipline that is required to develop your talents and to hone your skills? That's precisely what God wants you to do. And that's precisely what you should desire yourself to do. As you seek to expand your talents, you will undoubtedly encounter stumbling blocks along the way, such as the fear of rejection or the fear of failure. When you do, don't stumble, just continue to refine your skills and offer your services to God. And when the time is right, he will use you. But it's up to you to be thoroughly prepared when he does. Good morning, Adventist family. It's so nice to have you here on this Sabbath day. We have wonderful weather, a lot of activities going on today. We're thankful for those who, you who are visiting with us. We do have a fellowship luncheon, as was mentioned earlier, and you're welcome to stay. Thank you for those who are attending, and we pray, Lord, that you'll enjoy this service. We have Will Barron today as a guest speaker, and we ask, Lord, you will bless him and bless us as we partake in this service at this time. And now our opening song, if you will stand, is Because He Lives. God sent His Son they
Life is worth the living just because he lives. Amen. You may be seated.
In the prison, it was cold and damp as the prisoner sat there. It was gloomy. It was very lonely. The trial did not go well, and the prisoner was awaiting the verdict. He knew that the death sentence was imminent. As he was waiting for the official announcement of the verdict, he was given permission to write a last letter. Suppose you were in prison, perhaps under false charges, uh, perhaps you were visiting another country and there was a misidentity or maybe you were the victim of religious persecution somewhere and you were sentenced to death and you were allowed to write a last letter. Who would you write to? Someone very important, I'm sure. Maybe a wife or a husband, maybe a son or a daughter, maybe a nephew or a niece, and maybe some very, very special friend in your life. Perhaps if you're involved in ministry, maybe you would write a letter to a ministry colleague. What would you write about your last letter before you're executed or before you die. I'm sure it would be pertaining to very important matters. The prisoner is the Apostle Paul and he is in the Mamertine prison in Rome and he has been condemned to death because of religious persecution by the emperor. He wrote his last letter to his dear ministry colleague, Timothy his fellow missionary. We have a record of that letter, and it is in the Holy Bible, and it is the second letter to Timothy that Paul wrote. What Paul wrote about would be something very, very important. Let us turn in our Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. This morning I'm going to be reading from the New International Version of the Bible. Please follow along in whatever version you have with you. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, Paul writes, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Notice this is a prophecy pertaining to the future after Paul passes away. The time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Now we're doctrine we could use equivalent words, teaching, beliefs, or theology. Theology being based upon the Greek word, theo means God, and ology means knowledge of or study of. So theology is the study or knowledge of God, the study of his way, his righteousness. Paul prophesies, though, that a time will come when people are not interested in truth, they're not interested in the way of God, they seek out teachers and preachers to tell them what they want to hear. Now, Paul is talking about the Christian environment, and he is basically communicating that Christians in the future, at his own day, will have an unsanctified nature, a corrupt nature that is not from God. It will be a nature that is of this world, of Satan, the prince of this world. So he's not talking about atheists or secular people. He's saying the time will come when people are not interested in truth, true truth from God, but they want to hear what their itching ears want to hear, what their 
unsanctified nature wants to be told what they want to listen to. Verse 4, they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Are we living in an era, in a day, when this prophecy is being fulfilled? Do we find in Christianity that there are teachers and preachers uh, maybe out there on television, in the Adventist church, possibly even, who are not actually teaching truth, but are teaching something that is myth, that is not truth based upon Scripture. I want to give you this morning just one example, and I plan to talk more about this this afternoon after the lunch. Just one example of a fairly substantial leader in Christianity who recently had some very interesting things to say. The example is from a man called Bishop John D. Spong. He's now retired, but at the time he wrote in his diocese newsletter, he was the Bishop of Newark in New Jersey. I believe Newark is the capital there of the state of New Jersey. And in his diocese newsletter, which was titled Voice, he wrote the following. And this goes back a number of years, but this is the best example from the time I was a Christian after being rescued from New Age deception. Bishop Spong writes, in the fall of 1988, so we're looking at like 34 years ago, and the situation has got much worse today, but 34 years ago, which is fairly modern times, he says there, I worship God in a Buddhist temple. He apparently, for some reason, visited a Buddhist temple, and he writes, as the smell of the incense filled the air, I knelt before three images of Buddha, feeling that the smoke of the incense could carry my prayers heavenward. It was for me a holy moment. Beyond the creeds that each religion uses, there is a divine power that united us. I will not make any further attempt to convert the Buddhist, the Jew, the Hindu, or the Muslim. I am content to learn from them and to walk with them side by side toward the God who lives, I believe, beyond the images that bind and blind us. Bishop Spong is describing his experience in a Buddhist temple where he is knelt before three images or idols of Buddha. The Holy Scriptures in the Ten Commandments, and we have them a plaque there on the wall listing them, very clearly states in the First and Second Commandments that we are not to worship any other gods. We are not to worship Buddha. We are not to worship images of Buddha or images of anyone else. We are not even to worship images of Yahweh, the creator God of the Israelites. This is forbidden by God in the Ten Commandments. Constantly in the Old Testament, the Israelites, the people of God, were falling into apostasy and started worshiping the deities of the surrounding pagan nations. And God constantly sent prophets to warn them, to plead with them, to stop what they were doing and to turn to the one true creator God, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Bishop Spong wrote uh, that he felt he was kneeling side by side towards the God who lives, I believe, beyond the images that bind and blind us. If Jesus was living on earth today, I'm sure he would say, like he said to Bishop Spong, like he said to the Pharisees and the scribes and the chief priests in Jerusalem, that you are blind guides and you are hypocrites and you are not walking in the way of God. 
your father is not the creator God, my father in heaven. Your father is Satan himself, and you are agents of the devil. But this just illustrates the extent of the apostasy today, and this is a bishop, a leader in the Episcopalian church, and he is teaching material that is totally contrary to what the Bible teaches. He is basically expressing New Age beliefs and teachings, but he is not the only guilty one. I myself was guilty of the same offense. I was born and brought up as a Seventh-day Adventist and got involved in the New Age movement and became a New Age evangelist. Should have known better, but I didn't, unfortunately. And I was teaching the same kind of things that Bishop Spong was teaching. Paul wrote, for the time it will come. We can definitely say today, the time has come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. We may ask, well, what is the source of sound doctrine? Where do we get sound doctrine from? Let's turn to chapter 1 of this same epistle or letter that Paul wrote when he was in the Mamertine prison, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. Paul tells them, tells uh, Timothy, and it's a letter written to the whole church uh, in Christendom, Christianity, from the time of Paul onwards to our present day. This message still has validity. Paul writes, what you heard from me, from Paul, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Jesus Christ. So we can see here that what Paul taught was sound doctrine. And why? Because he got it directly from Jesus himself. Verse 14, guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. So together with the sound doctrine of what is written in Scripture, in the Holy Bible, both the Old and the New Testaments, we need to have the Holy Spirit to help us guard the truthfulness of Scripture, to help us give us understanding of the sound doctrine that scripture represents so that we can wisely and righteously divide the scripture, rightly put it into practice, rightly apply it to our lives. The apostle Paul received direct instructions and training from Jesus himself. Paul was a prophet of God, revealing divine truth from heaven. Paul tells us where he gets his information from in Galatians chapter 1. Turn with me, if you will, to the epistle. Paul also wrote to a different church now, not uh, to his colleague Timothy, but writing to the church in Galatia. This it was in Asia Minor, the present-day uh, country of Turkey. Galatians chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. Galatians chapter 1, verse 11 and 12, Paul writes, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, there in Galatia, and also it applies to us today, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Paul was a prophet, received direct revelation from Jesus. Verse 15, but when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult with any human being. Verse 17, I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. So Paul received direct training, direct teaching and information that he later shared with 
the different churches and shared through these epistles. He received it directly from God. Paul was a, a great prophet of God. Paul writes in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, we're now going back to his last letter, wrote there from the Mamantine prison in Rome, 2 Timothy chapter um, 3, verse 14. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, Paul is writing to Timothy, his colleague, and he tells him, but as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned. What he learned from Paul and learned from the other apostles. Timothy was also a fellow worker at some stages with Barnabas and uh, with Peter and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you have learned it, from the apostles. Paul, of course, as well as being a prophet, was an apostle. Apostle is from the Greek apostolos. It means one who is sent out, which basically means a missionary, a senior missionary. Verse 15 again to Timothy. And how from infancy you, Timothy, have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, in Jesus Christ. Verse 16, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servants of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Are you servants of God? Are you wanting to do every good work that the Lord would in particular have you do according to your gifts and abilities? Well, the scripture is your source for training in righteousness so that you may be thoroughly equipped. Are you happy that you're a part of a church that believes in all of scripture and not just parts and pieces and bits and pieces of scripture, but all of scripture is God-breathed, is inspired and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Paul warned in his first letter uh, to Timothy in, about what is going to happen in the future. We read it as our scripture reading. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Paul writes there, The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, clearly says that in latter times or last days, are we in the last days? If we are, this is for us. In the latter times or last days, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. So Paul warns, even in the church, some are going to abandon the faith. And instead of following the teachings of Scripture, they're going to follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons that are going to be involved in some manner in spiritualism, communication with spirits, and they're going to be inspired or motivated by evil spirits, by demons, by Satan's evil angels. Verse 2, such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry, uh, uh, and they uh, order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. Uh, in, if you study Paul's rest of the epistles, he's talking about food sacrifice to idols, that there is not, you actually are not prohibited f from eating food sacrificed to idols. You don't need to worry about that at all. Now, it's interesting, though, that these false teachings will come through false teachers who are inspired by demons, by Satan's evil angels. Let's turn back to Paul in prison there, in the Mamertine prison in Rome. He was sentenced to death and he was executed, but he first knew about his imminent martyrdom, or soon coming martyrdom, should we say, near the end of his third missionary journey. 
On that third missionary journey, it took him to Greece, to Macedonia, and back through Asia Minor. And on the return leg, he sailed by ship, by boat from Greece, and he stopped off at the port city of Miletus. That was the port city for the very huge city of Ephesus. Ephesus was on the coast, but it had a port like in Los Angeles, you've got the port of San Pedro or Long Beach as well. And uh, so Paul went to visit, and he broke his journey and went to visit the elders of the church of nearby Ephesus. Ephesus was a large city, like was the equivalent of a Chicago uh, t today, in today's terms. It wasn't that big, but in, in its day, it would be like the same size relative to other cities as Chicago. And the book of Acts describes the event of Paul meeting with those church elders from the church there, the early church in Ephesus. Turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to Acts chapter 20, and we're going to read verse 25 and onwards. Acts chapter 20, verse 25 and onwards. Paul there is with these elders from the church in Ephesus, and he tells them, Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. So he, had, he knew he was never going to go back to Ephesus. None of these elders were going to see him again. Let's jump to verse 27. For I have not has hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, or sometimes it will use the word, in some versions, the word bishops. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Paul addressing those local elders, advising them, be good shepherds of the flocks. Verse 29, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Your King James Version words it, grievous wolves. Have you seen grievous wolves in the church? Uh, have you seen them here in the Ojai Church or maybe some other Adventist church that you've visited? How about on Christian television? Have you seen savage or grievous wolves on some of the Christian television channels? Let me tell you why you may have not seen them. Jesus tells us in Matthew 7, verse 15, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves or savage wolves or grievous wolves. So they actually look like sheep, but it's inside where they are savage wolves. They wear sheep's clothing. Uh, that's why you don't see them, because they are dressed like sheep. Well, I at one time must admit I was a false prophet when I was involved in the New Age movement. I was wearing sheep's clothing. I wore clothing just like I wear now. I was uh, quite a number of years younger than I am now, you know, something like uh, 36 years or so, 35 years younger than I am now. But I just look like regular Christians. In the book of Revelation, chapter 13, you've the, a prophecy of two beasts. You've got the first beast, which is a leopard-like beast, and it's followed by a lamb-like beast out of the earth. And it looks like a lamb. It has two horns, sheep, well, at least rams have horns. So they look Christian. The lamb is a representative of Jesus Christ. So false shepherds actually look like Jesus. But in Revelation 13, it tells us that this beast speaks with the voice of a dragon, the voice of Satan. 
my main missionary task as a New Ager was to infiltrate Christian churches and to try to introduce Eastern Transcendental Meditation into those churches and tr with the idea that if you practice this Eastern Transcendental Meditation, and we'll talk more about that this afternoon, you can directly hear God's voice and you can become a prophet of God like I was. Fortunately, I was a false prophet, but I thank God that my parents were praying for me in dedication for 16 years. And after 16 years, God answered their prayers in a very dramatic manner, rescued me from that terrible deception. In Matthew 7, verse 16, Jesus states, "'Ye shall know them by their fruit. "'If you would have known about my life at the time "'and what my fruit was, "'you would have known very clearly "'that I was a false prophet, a false apostle.'" Let's back, go back to Acts chapter 20, verse 30. Paul here tells the Ephesian elders a message for us today. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. Now, here in OI, we're a small church. But the Ephesus church would have been a substantial early church because of the size of the city. And... Uh, Paul even warns, even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth. Verse 31, so be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Paul ministered to the church in Ephesus for three years. It was the longest time he ever spent in any one single church. And he warned them with tears. Verse 32. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, to the holy scriptures, as they became at that time, of course. They didn't have the scriptures of the New Testament as we had today. They just had Paul's teaching and the teachings of the other apostles like Barnabas and, and Timothy. I commit uh, to you, I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So the methodology of being able to be immune from the influence of the false apostles, the deceitful workmen masquerading as apostles of Christ, is to be thoroughly grounded in the word of grace, in the word of God, in the Holy Scriptures. And through those scriptures, we are sanctified. And as we're sanctified, we are equipped with that full armor of God to fight the good fight and to be victorious over all false apostles and false teachers and false doctrines. Let's go to verse 36. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. Can you picture them in your imagination there? Knelt down besides the docks there and they're praying. Verse 37, they all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. The Ephesian, Ephesian elders loved the Apostle Paul. He must have been a tremendous person to know. Tremendous person, this tremendous man of God probably had an incredibly loving character and uh, his love shines through all of his epistles, the care he had for those elders and for the members of the church there in Ephesus. Paul departed that port of Miletus in AD 57, just approximately 26 years after the crucifixion of Jesus. He wrote his last letter to Timothy 
in AD 66, and shortly thereafter, maybe possibly in AD 6, early AD 67, he was executed. Has Paul's prophecy come true about the apostasy occurring even from within the church? Has that prophecy come true? I would very briefly like to read you a list of the different types of apostasies that have come into Christianity in the centuries since the Apostle Paul's day. In AD 120, which was, you know, about 60 years or so after Paul wrote his epistle, the church started to practice holy water sprinkling. The idea that water could be in some way sanctified and sprinkled on you or sprinkled in the church and it would sanctify you or sanctify the church. This was an aberration of an Old Testament, Old Covenant teaching about the, um, the hyssop was put in water and there was animal blood put in the water and it could be sprinkled for cleansing. It was called the, the water of cleansing. But that was an Old Covenant practice. It was part of the ceremonial law that had no part in New Covenant Christianity. But the early church succumbed to some very strange teachings, and it started out with this holy water thing. Then in AD 157, there was the doctrine of penance, the idea that Jesus does not fully atone and pay the penalty for your sins, but you have to do certain works and certain things you have to do in order to be fully forgiven. The blood of Christ does forgive you, but it's a not a full forgiveness. You have to play your part beyond repentance. Uh, there is always penance in t terms of heartfelt repentance for sin, but this was something you had to do or suffer beyond repentance. AD 310, prayers started to be offered for the dead. The Bible tells us the dead know nothing. They are asleep in the grave. It is futile to offer prayers for the dead in the hope that in the judgment, people will be kind to them. Jesus is the judge. He judges justly. He doesn't need us to pray for that judgment. We need to be praying for the living, not for the dead. In AD 320, candles started to be offered, burning candles for the deceased, uh, you know, because they may be suffering somewhere in hell or whatever, and if you have a candle, that might help them along or give them some grace or something. AD 363, to 364 of the church council in Laodicea, Canon 29 mandated the sanctification and rest on Sunday, and it described biblical Sabbath keeping as Judaizing and frowned upon it and said that Christians should not be Judaizing and keeping the Sabbath day holy. In AD 375, there was a process where certain deceased Christians were regarded to be special saints and they were canonized as saints. The Bible very clearly teaches that all believers on, in Christ are God's holy people. Saint simply means a sanctified person, a holy person. All Christians are saints. AD 414, there began to be the adoration and veneration of the Virgin Mary. AD 610, the Emperor Phocas, Emperor of the Roman Empire, titled the Bishop of Rome as being universal bishop, head of all other bishops, a position that no one ever had except the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the head of the church. 
AD 715, prayers were offered to the Virgin Mary because it was believed in her spirit she was in heaven and prayers were offered to deceased saints because it was believed they were alive in the spirit being formed in heaven. So why not offer prayers to them? Well, we know the Virgin Mary and all the great apostles are still in the grave awaiting for the resurrection. A.D. 787 began the adoration of icons of the Virgin Mary, of baby Jesus, and various saints, and the adoration of icons. Uh, in the Greek, an image is called an icon. Uh, in, in the Greek language, in the New Testament, uh, the word icon actually is any kind of image, whether it's a statue or an idol, or whether it's a picture that you worship and adore, a picture on a wall. AD 788, one year later, there was a veneration of relics, you know, clothing worn by the apostles and maybe the, the uh, gown of Jesus or parts of it or whatever that they claimed were genuine would be venerated. AD 965, baptism by sprinkling. The very word baptism, baptizo in the Greek of the New Testament, means to submerge. The very word means submerge. In Greek Orthodox churches, they know what Greek means, and they practice immersion baptism. But in the Western church, AD 965, baptism by sprinkling. Sprinkling is not baptism. The Paul... So Paul teaches clearly that baptism, you are immersed under the water. It is a symbol of the grave of Jesus. And it is a death to the old self and coming out of the water is resurrection to a new life in Christ as a Christian to live the new life of Jesus. Around the year 1000, the Eucharist or Mass or what started out as the Holy Communion became a sacrifice and a mandatory sacrament. Uh, Jesus never intended for communion to be a form of sacrifice and, you know, not mandatory, it must be, you know, once a week or whatever. Uh, no, no, it was remembrance. It was a remembrance of the upper room of that Last Supper and the remembrance of the crucifixion of Jesus that occurred just a few hours later. AD 1079, celibacy of the priesthood. The Apostle Paul tells us that an elder or a bishop must be the husband of not more than one wife. But to be a husband is the ideal means if you're going to be a bishop. And a bishop or an elder, in Greek it's presbyteros, which means priest. Elders and, and, and uh, uh, bishops, they're all, we're priests. It's a priesthood of believer. Every believer is a priest. We don't need to go to a priest to seek for forgiveness from God. We go directly to the true tabernacle above. We don't need to be going to celibate priests. And as you know, many of them were pedophile priests at that at the same time, the same time as they were forgiving sins of other people, or claiming to forgive sins of of their parishioners. AD 1098, the granting of indulgences for participation in the Crusades. Indulgences is the idea that can, it, it, it's very much connected with penance. It's the idea that. The crucified Jesus, his suffering and death on the cross, is not enough to forgive your sins. You need to also do certain works or certain acts or go on certain pilgrimage or certain sufferings in order to fully expiate for your sin. Indulgences was a method whereby you could lift this burden of sin that is not completed on the cross. And uh, indulgences were given. So if you were willing to participate in the cru Crusades, you didn't have to uh, do penance. It, it, just participating in the Crusade was your penance. Nothing in the Bible tells us that we are not fully forgiven by the shed blood of Jesus. AD 1214, 
praying the rosary with repetitive words, Jesus tells us clearly in prayer, do not say repetitive words. We are not to do that. We are not to babble like the pagans do. A.D. 1215, the next year, the dogma of transubstantiation was introduced, the idea that in Holy Communion or the Eucharist, the, the bread, the wafer, literally is the blood of Jesus, or the, the body of Jesus, his flesh. And when you eat it, you're fulfilling the teaching of Jesus in the Gospel of John, chapter 6. Well, Jesus tells us that when he says, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood, he later, at the end, towards the end of the chapter, he says, these are spiritual things. This is figurative language. It's not literal. Those pedophile priests, many of those were practicing the mass every day. Did it help them overcome terrible, terrible sin, one of the worst sins imaginable? It did not help them. The problem was in that dogma. The year 1215, confessions to priests were made mandatory at least once a year. Jesus tells us, confess your sins to the Father. Go into your closet and confess to your Father and you will be forgiven, completely forgiven. You don't need a priest to uh, hear a confession. Now, that, there's nothing wrong with having counseling from pastors and prayer. Not at all. But the actual forgiveness itself is directly from God. The year 1229, a prohibition was instituted against the reading of the Bible by laypersons. The charge was that when laypersons read the Bible, they're going to be confused and what they're going to, they're, they're going to misunderstand scriptures. And it's only the priests and the universal church that can correctly interpret Bible. Certainly, reading the Bible gave problems. I understand why the priests and all the administrators of the church in that day wanted laypersons not to read Scripture. It would divide. It would be divisive, and it certainly would be. And that division would be blessed by God. Not desired, but required. It would be necessary. The year 1274, the dogma of purgatory, the idea that there's an in-between place. Uh, not, there's, it's not a matter of going to heaven or hell. There's an in-between place, purgatory, where some people need to go to suffer more penance. And, uh, of course, uh, when Martin Luther started the Protestant Reformation, there was a monk, Tetzel, from the Vatican that was offering people that they could they would not spend any time in purgatory guaranteed if you would just donate uh, towards the uh, rebuilding of St. Paul's Cathedral not St. Paul's Cathedral the, the St. Peter's Cathedral yes uh, there in the Vatican or whatever they were, I think they were, that's why they were raising money but it was to fund uh, the Vatican and you you would be guaranteed you're, you're not going to go into purgatory you'll go straight to heaven when you die the year A.D. 1545, the dogma was released by the papacy that church tradition has equal authority with the Bible. So whatever tradition had been before the year 1545, all these different traditions that I've just listed have equal authority with Scripture. Boy, what a way of rendering the scriptures obsolete and teaching that which is against the teaching of scripture by saying tradition has equal authority. Finally, 1817, you had the dogma of papal infallibility. This was the dogma that if the pope decides to sit in his cathedral chair to be sitting ex cathedra, and to announce beforehand that he was going to speak at cathedra, whatever he stated from his cathedral chair would be infallible. It, there would be absolutely no error. Let me add, though, there are restrictions 
in that dogma. The Pope cannot say anything contrary to Scripture or contrary to existing tradition. So it is a very limited infallibility, but nevertheless, it is a claim of being infallible. The scripture itself, it says, itself tells us that only God is infallible. Every, all have fallen short of the grace of God and the glory of God. We are all sinners. We are all fallible. Only God himself is infallible. Did God just allow apostate doctrine to happen? Was God kind of on a cloud somewhere enjoying himself while this apostasy was going on? Absolutely not. God did intercede to counter apostasy in the church. The Holy Spirit motivated many pastors and teachers and bishops, or as we would call them, conference presidents in the Adventist denomination, and scholars and lay people. He motivated them to counter these false teachings that were coming in the church and which Paul had warned about. God inspired John Wycliffe in 1384 to be a dissident Catholic preach, priest and preach against some of these false doctrines. He is described as the morning star of the Reformation. And he was the first person to translate the Bible into English. And he wrote many papers or documents that were against the traditions that were coming into the Catholic Church in his day. He wrote against unsound doctrine. And his materials were distributed throughout continental Europe. A man called Jan Hus from Bohemia, that's modern day Czech Republic, he studied the materials of John Wycliffe, was deeply influenced by them, and he broke from Catholic authority, and he started the Bohemian Reformation in 1412. Then in 1517, Martin Luther, also a Catholic priest and scholar in the country of Saxony in what modern-day Germany, he realized that a lot of these traditions, these dogmas, were totally contradictory to Scripture, and he stood up for Scripture, and especially against indulgences by Tetzel. And he wrote a list of 95 points of doctrine from Scripture, 95 Scripture issues that were against indulgences and started the Protestant Reformation beginning there in that church there in Wittenberg where he nailed the 95 Theses onto the church door. Then, um, Short while later, William Tyndale, who was a scholar educated in Oxford and Cambridge, he translated the New Testament into English directly from the Greek. Wycliffe's translation was from the Latin, but this was from the original Greek, translated it, and it was the first time in English the Bible was printed. Uh, Wycliffe's translation was handwritten and copied and distributed, but now the Bible in English the language of the people was printed in 1526. And then much later, our last person that I want to mention, in December 1844, God gave a lady in Portland, Maine, called Ellen White, a vision, just two months after the great disappointment. God interceded in this lady's life to bring new teachings, new revelation, to bring a focus on scripture and the deeper meaning of scripture, a deeper prophetic understanding. And I was personally rescued from terrible deception through reading Ellen White's materials. The prophet of the Old Testament, Joel, or Joel, Hoel in Spanish, he prophesied exactly what happened to Ellen White. Reading Joel chapter two, verse 28, the book of Joel, it's one of the minor prophets there in the Old Testament, chapter two, verse 28. And afterwards, I, that's God speaking, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. 
your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. The prophet Amos, just the next book after Joel, in chapter 3, verse 7, informs us, Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. God had a plan for the last days. He had a plan to counter the apostasy. God chose Ellen White to be a servant, to be a messenger and a prophet, to introduce materials that would warn about the deep apostasy that has occurred throughout the era of Christianity, but especially to warn about the apostasy that would occur in the last days. In 1844, the time had come for God to reveal his plans for the last days. And we're going to talk more about that this afternoon. Uh, I, have a, I had a handout that was distributed, and we're going to talk about that a little bit this afternoon. But for those of you that are not able to come this afternoon, at least this is some material which I believe demonstrates that Ellen White had a tremendous prophetic gift from God. And uh, we can all acknowledge that we were sinners. We were all under Satan's control at one time or another to a certain depth or other. Some of you maybe not very deep. Someone like me was totally depraved, totally demonized, totally deluded, and in, in total apostasy and deception and God reached out through Ellen White to rescue me we can rejoice and give thanks for the John Wycliffe's for the Jan Husses for the Martin Luther's and for the William Tyndale's also for these great reformers that God raised up to counter the apostasy in their day we are involved in a battle a battle of fighting the good fight of faith Satan wants to destroy our witness. He wants to, if possible, divide and destroy the Seventh-day Adventist church and render it null and void. But we have a God who is more powerful than Satan and all of his evil angels and all of his human agents. And our God will have the victory. Today is number 506, A Mighty Fortress. And if you will stand, please. Thank you. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you are a mighty fortress. We're so thankful that you sent prophets like the Apostle Paul to warn of what will happen in Christianity. You don't want us to be discouraged. You want to, us to know, to be aware of what is happening and to be on our guard. We're so thankful for the reformers like Martin Luther who took a stand against apostasy. We're so thankful that you sent Ellen White as a messenger with a special focus on the truths for the last days. We're so thankful that we can be part of that special remnant church that you have established to maintain a pillar of truth and a pillar of light. We're so thankful that we don't have to confide in our own strength, but we can strive together with the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome every deception, every temptation, every trick and darkness and delusion coming from the evil one and that we can stand victorious on that great day. We pray that everyone here that is present right now will be protected from the deception that is out there in the world and even coming into the churches. Uh, help us all to have a strong faith and to tarry till that great day when the bridegroom will come. For asking this in Jesus' name, amen.
Oh!